uh, Matt Hoskins, I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I work primarily for the NHS with a bit of research and a bit of lecturing work for Cardiff Uni as well. And that's just a, a little picture of the, the place that I'm from. That's the Cardiff Castle in the center of our city. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, uh, kind of like an, an update on the, the latest evidence for pharmacological interventions for PTSD. So I've, um, I've, I've, I've written a couple of papers, uh, I've updated one from a few years ago, um, essentially looking at uh, monotherapy approaches, augmentation approaches, and then also drug assisted uh, therapy ap approaches. So they've, um, they've recently been published in the EJPT. Um, and uh, uh, we also used the, uh, the work that I did there to um, uh, guide the ISTSS um, uh, treatment guidelines. So there's two, ch two chapters in there. And working with Prof Bisson and some really excellent students from Cardiff as well, we put together what we call the Cardiff algorithm, which is for um, clinicians in primary and secondary mental health care to know what to prescribe, what, what evidence-based treatments you can use in, in PTSD and which direction you should go through. Um, so uh, yeah, this is just a flow diagram that showed all the um, studies that, that came into and were included in our series of systematic reviews. Um, so you can see that overall, there was about 115 studies that we included, and then we, we split them into monotherapy augmentation primarily and drug assisted. So I'll kind of split my talk into those separate uh, uh, parts as well. So the main uh, points to take away in terms of randomized con control trials um, with evidence where a single agent outperforms a placebo, um, you know, with a number of different studies or, or fairly good sample sizes, these are the drugs that you can use in monotherapy for PTSD. So um, paroxetine, sertraline, fluoxetine, the three SSRIs, that has evidence now for being used in, um, that can be recommended for use in monotherapy treatment. Um, so I'll, I'll go through, you know, uh, some of the forest plots for, for each of them really briefly, and then we can kind of talk about, you know, the, the, the use of these drugs and some of the limitations. As you can see, Peroxine here, there were three studies, um, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the effect size there clearly points in the direction of Peroxidine being more effective than placebo. Uh, there were more studies for sertraline, um, and we can see, again, yeah, looking in the right direction for sertraline being more effective than placebo. Fluoxetine, just, uh, just crossing that line of no effect there, um, but that can be recommended. Then the vaccine, um, similar effect size uh, to paroxetine. And then one study with sufficient numbers here for us to be able to recommend uh, monotherapy treatment with quetiapine, which is really useful. Um, so there were also some single um, small RCTs that showed, you know, these agents in particular were better than placebo, but they were quite small. Um, and it'd be fantastic if there were, there were more research looking at these uh, drugs that, you know, we could then meta-analyze in the future. But for the time being, amitriptyline, metazapine, phenylzine, and this very strange drug company um, uh, uh, um, kind of manufactured GR205171, which really rolls off the tongue, but it's a neurokinin one antagonist. Um, so these are the drugs that were no better than placebo, and these were mostly single studies. Sometimes there were, there were, there were two studies, like for olanzapine, but these drugs didn't fare any better than placebo. And what's interesting is there's two, um, you know, SSRIs, there's citalopram and escitalopram. Um, uh, there's also, you know, uh, brofaramine, where phenylzine had one positive one, brofaramine was actually uh, poorer than placebo. So um, we, 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 we don't think that there is a class effect for, or we can't really say there's a class effect for antidepressants when it comes to treating PTSD. You really can't say SSRIs are all effective in treating PTSD. Very specific SSRIs are effective in treating PTSD. So a lot of times when maybe someone's been referred into my team from primary care and the GPs put them on escitalopram or citalopram, the first thing that we do is take them off that and put them onto something which is evidence-based. Um, interestingly as well, there's a, a number of drugs there which um, we do commonly use in, um, in clinical practice, which just haven't been investigated. So, um, you know, sleep is a really big problem when it comes to treating 
PTSD. Um, we should always try to avoid the potentially addictive, the habit forming, Z meds, you know, Zopiclone, um, and of course, like the Benz, like Tamazepam, where you can. So typically, you know, I, I, I try to try to use some um, uh, low risk medications first, like promethazine or melatonin. But trazodone is one of my go-to medications when it comes to PTSD. But that hasn't really been looked at as a as an RC, RCT. Other drugs like duloxetine hasn't been looked at, and with venlafaxine being you know so so comparatively effective, it'd be really useful to know what effect duloxetine has in in PTSD, and then other drugs you know that's sometimes used for anxiety like um, clonidine that hasn't you know there's been no good quality RCTs looking at that. So that's monotherapy. In terms of augmentation, um, again, this is something that we commonly do in practice. You've got someone on one medication, maybe they've had a partial response, you've got them up to the max dose, you're kind of thinking they just need something a little bit extra. What can I add to their monotherapy? And um, we found that there are two medications that we can recommend. Uh, so the first is a bit of a game changer, uh, Prazosin. So this has been around for a while. Um, it's a medication that's actually used in cardiology, so heart failure, hypertension, um, but for some reason it has this very specific effect on reducing the uh, severity and intensity of nightmares, trauma-related nightmares, and for some lucky patients as well, it actually spills over into the following day and they might also enjoy uh, some diminished daytime intrusive uh, symptoms. Not everyone, but some patients report that. And again, for a smaller number still of patients, they might experience less hyperarousal during the day. Uh, but primarily the target there is, is nightmares. And then we've got another atypical risperidone. Um, so, so, so two antipsychotics there have got evidence for, for use. Quetiapine as monotherapy, risperidone as an augmentation agent that you would add to another medication and most randomized control trials that we included um, they they used different kind of uh, um, primary medications they were mostly SSRIs sometimes it was an SNRI that they then augmented with prazosin or, or risperidone so this is the uh, the forest plot for for prazosin and you can see that it is yeah just just past the line of no effect um, when you dig down into the different ways that it's used, um, there's a range of doses. Typically it's maybe between, you know, 10 to 16 milligrams daily. Um, higher doses are more effective, it seems, and a split dose is, is likely more effective as well. So taking a small dose in the morning and a larger dose at nighttime. Um, now, prazosin is completely off license, of course, for, for PTSD. Most drugs that we use are off license for PTSD. There's only, only two of the license. Um, so uh, from my practice, I encounter quite a lot of difficulty in initiating patients with, um, with prazosin. They're general practitioners in primary care, don't want to prescribe it. There's oftentimes um, supply issues, uh, at least locally in, 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 in the UK, where um, just from time to time, the, the pharmacists, they cannot get a hold of it. Um, and that can be a big, big problem for the patients if they've been used to benefiting from it, and then all of a sudden it disappears. So um, what we've been tending to do is actually um, sometimes use doxazosin, which is another related drug, which hasn't been you know, investigated specifically in, uh, in PTSD to this extent. But um, anecdotally, in my own practice, if patients have benefited from prazosin, they've also benefited maybe to a lesser extent from doxazosin. And prazosin, like I say, is a, a game-changing drug for a lot of patients. Um, but there are questions over when is it best used? Because, of, you know, there's not, not really any guidance, you know, at, at the moment in terms of when it's best used. But um, do use prazosin to treat nightmares in patients who are on waiting lists for therapy. So patients who might be um, psychotherapy naive and they're on a waiting list, maybe they're languishing on that waiting list for a year and a half or two years or longer. If you put them on prazosin, it removes their nightmares. What happens then when they're about to start the therapy? Do you reduce and remove the prazosin before they start or in the early phases of therapy? Might it interfere with the therapeutic relationship if you're introducing worsening symptoms in the first few weeks of therapy? So, so different people have got different approaches to it. I tend to warn patients when you're a week or two away from starting therapy, start to reduce the dose because you really need to access those nightmares in order to um, know that the therapy is working, but, but to have more material to work on during the therapy. 
um, it's clearer when someone's been through an evidence-based uh, trauma-focused psychological therapy. If they've come out the other end and they still have residual nightmares, that's clearly where prioritizing should be mostly used. But I do think there's an argument there for, you know, the humane use of it when people are on waiting lists as well, because, um, yeah, the waiting list in our country is, is, is quite a long time for a trauma-focused therapy. So risperidone, you know, it's um, it's the most typical of the atypical antipsychotics. So, um, uh, you know, at low doses, it doesn't generally cause too much of a problem. But then at higher doses, you do get more of the um, extra parental side effects. Uh, you do get more of the, uh, you know, dopamine blockade and the tuber infundibular pathway. So you do tend to get more um, uh, hyperprolactinemia. Um, in a lot of ways, quetiapine may be a better choice um, uh, in terms of the side effect profile for some patients, but it's always worth, you know, of course, discussing with patients. These are the two medications that we have. Here are the common, notable and serious side effects. I'd lean this way. Which way do you think you'd lean in terms of the, the side effect profile? But you can use risperidone in, in augmentation. So um, the things to consider then, um, there's, there's, there's a handful of medications that we've got in our toolbox when it comes to pharma, pharmacological treatment for PTSD. They are effective, but the effects are small. Essentially, these medications are going to soften the edges, they're going to lighten the overall symptom burden, and we hope intuitive, intuitively that they may be able to better engage with trauma-focused therapies. Um, you know, if the symptom burden is maybe less overwhelming, um, if they're on an evidence-based treatment, they may do better in, in therapy. But, um, you know, should we hold out hope that there's going to be a, a, new, a new medication just around the corner, a new conventional treatment? Um, you know, is it, is it going to potentially be significantly better than what we already have? Um, I think Probably not. You know, there are newer medications that haven't been looked at in PTSD. The ones that we've mentioned, some uh, uh, newer antidepressants like the multimodal uh, vortioxetine. It'd be interesting to see what these do. Um, probably we can't expect them to do much better than than these agents that we already have. Um, I've talked a little bit about prazosin and and kind of when to use that. Um, some of the barriers in in uh, in using it in terms of availability. You know, locally, it can cause, can cause headaches. Um, but essentially, we know that our patients should be engaging in the gold standard treatment, which is you know, trauma-focused psychological therapies. Um, however, these can be very hard to tolerate. We know from research evidence that you know, in some studies, up to 54% of patients can't actually tolerate you know, doing this work. And dropout levels can be high, both in uh, clinical studies and in you know, clinical practice that we see. So the question that's raised is how do we improve the tolerability and efficacy of uh, trauma-focused psychological therapies? You know, can we do that with drugs? Can we give someone a drug alongside a course of therapy or maybe a drug at a specific point during a trauma-focused therapy to improve the tolerability and the efficacy of it? So if you were to go away and design a drug, um, and if you had a magic wand and, um, you know, you wanted to design a specific drug that could assist trauma focused psychological therapies, what characteristics would you want that drug to have if you could wave a magic wand? You'd want it to hold the person within the optimal arousal zone or the window of optimal arousal, or if you want to say it, whereby um, the person is emotionally engaged enough to face their memories and do work on the memories and go through that window. They're not overwhelmed and overshoot it and they're not, you know, detached or dissociating and undershoot it. So you'd want a drug to do something to the fear circuitry of the brain. If it could dampen the amygdala and the insula overactivity, if it could uh, bring the medial prefrontal cortex, the kind of emotional breaks back on board and, and kind of redress that, that kind of hyperactivity in the front and the hyperactivity in the in the amygdala and insula, that would be fantastic. Um, you'd want it to paradoxically be, be a relaxing drug. You, you'd want something that would, um, you know, take the, take, 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 the, take the intensity out of, you know, the difficult work that you'd be doing in terms of, um, you know, trauma-focused work. If it could motivate someone to talk, if it could make them more talkative, it could if it could remove their their, their defensiveness or um, their coldness, again, that would be really really useful. And um, of course, if it could, if it could improve the quality of the therapeutic alliance, 
um, that would be wonderful because you know the, the the quality of the rapport of the trust and empathy between the the therapist and the patient is a very strong, if not one of the strongest predictors of a, of a positive outcome in psychotherapy, regardless of model. Um, so just bear that in mind if you were to design a drug like that. So when it comes to drug assisted therapies in terms of published uh, RCTs, there's two broad approaches. You've got conventional approaches and kind of novel ones. So the conventional approaches um, are um, where someone maybe has um, started a course of say prolonged exposure, they haven't quite um, uh, responded that well to it. So then they've added in a medication and they've continued the study and then they've continued the therapy alongside it. Um, or they've been started on a conventional medication like an SSRI or an SS SNRI. Um, and then after some time, if they haven't fully responded, uh, prolonged exposure or another type of therapy is added into it. Now, some of the, some of the studies um, had some kind of design issues when it, when it came to, um, to that model. I felt that um, a lot of them were adding in medication and then you know, four or five weeks later, measuring an endpoint um, when really we know there's 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 quite a large therapeutic lag with conventional uh, monoaminergic uh, medications. So so any drug that works on serotonin or, or dopamine or noradrenaline, typically you see some improvements after a number of weeks, but we're really waiting six to eight weeks before you get the full effect coming through. Um, so some of these studies didn't quite allow that amount of time to account for therapeutic lag and maybe underestimated their, their effectiveness because of that. The novel approaches, this is where you've got maybe a course of therapy and uh, you've got one, two or three or maybe more than that drug assisted sessions whereby you take a specific substance right before you start a, 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 um, a therapeutic session and that drug is acutely acting on the uh, uh, participant during that session. And then you do work to integrate what they may have learned afterwards. So the two drugs that have been primarily looked at here, are DCS or decycloserine and MDMA, which I'll focus on in the, in the latter part of my talk. Um, and Eric, just give me a wave if, I, if I'm waffling on because I do tend to waffle on when I talk about MDMA. <laughs> You're um, good. You're good, Matt. Good. So I'll just go through the evidence. So these are, the studies included for an SSRI plus placebo, uh, plus therapy, sorry, versus uh, placebo plus therapy. So a medication plus therapy versus placebo plus therapy. As you can see, uh, mixed results there and overall not better than placebo, touching that line of no effect. Um, this is uh, another one looking at um, SSRI plus prolonged exposure versus SSRI alone. And again, uh, kind of mixed results and not passing that line of effect. Um, Overall, in terms of the conventional approaches, there's really a paucity of literature out there. There, there, um, there may be a truer effect uh, that, that we're not seeing, um, but, but you know, when we're looking at essentially um, six studies altogether, we, we can't draw firm conclusions. We know from our own kind of clinical practice that most patients are on a medication by the time they get to a trauma-focused therapy. Um, right now in the literature, we can't recommend that, that, that you know, that, that, that is an evidence-based intervention, uh, you know, uh, uh, as such, but really there were kind of methodological problems with the studies included. Okay, and uh, this was DCS. So um, DCS is a drug that in animal models um, enhances, it, enhances fear extinction, and it has been used in other anxiety related conditions, um, you know, uh, phobias and these sorts of things to enhance the, the thera therapeutic outcome. Um, interestingly, um, you know, it, it did not show um, uh, superiority to placebo. It was quite a mixed effect, although when you do look at the studies and, and break down the different ways that it was used, um, uh, the studies that tended to use a higher dose, such as uh, Defeed 2014, had a slightly better outcome, leaning in the direction of, sort of um, you know, uh, DCS being more effective. And the studies that gave DCS um, uh, for a longer period of time before the session started, so more like 90 minutes as opposed to 60 minutes, tended to show possibly a more, you know, beneficial effect of DCS. Um, so maybe higher doses, maybe give the dose and then wait an hour or, or two hours um, before the session starts. In future, more research in this area may show that it, 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 it may be beneficial, but at the moment with these four studies, it, it really isn't. Um, so moving on to MDMA-assisted therapy. So if you haven't heard of this before, I will explain uh, what MDMA-assisted therapy is, but uh, these are the four um, to date published uh, RCTs looking at 
MDMA-assisted therapy versus um, placebo or active placebo-assisted therapy. And these have all been sponsored by the, uh, the organization MAPS in America. That's the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. Uh, they're a nonprofit, uh, principally set up to research psychedelic drugs like MDMA. Um, so we can see here that, um, that there's, there's quite a striking effect size. Um, and what's notable here is that the majority, if not all the patients included in these studies had at least severe PTSD and uh, a, a significant number of them had treatment resistant PTSD as well. So these were not treatment naive patients. They may not have all received a technically evidence-based um, uh, PTSD treatment beforehand. So they would have had a mix of medications. They would have had a mix of uh, psychological approaches. Some of them aren't really evidence-based uh, strictly. So, you know, brief psychodynamic therapy, you know, isn't, isn't an evidence-based um, TFPT. But, you know, nevertheless, these, these were patients who were difficult to treat and they um, had quite, quite, a, quite a profound um, effect from MDMA-assisted therapy. So this is quite an exciting new treatment, um, which I'll tell you about now. So um, MDMA is a 3,4-methyl-endioxymethamphetamine. It's a ring substituted phenethylamine structurally related to methamphetamine and amphetamine, and it's a psychedelic drug. So it's an illegal class A drug in my country. You'd go to prison for a, a life-altering amount of time if you were, if you were found with it. Um, uh, it is um, a psychedelic in the same sense that um, it has um, activity on 5-HT2A. So, so the classical psychedelics of uh, lysergic acids, you know, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, they all have uh, activity on 5-HT2A. MDMA does as well, but to a, a lesser effect than the classicals. Um, it's a profoundly empathogenic psychedelic, so it's called the love drug um, because of the profound pro-social experience that you have when, when you're taking it. Um, typically, the experience lasts from between two to six hours, the peak experience. So it will probably bleed over into about eight hours until you're back to normal. And it is a, um, uh, a profoundly um, altering substance in terms of your consciousness. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a psychedelic drug with psychedelic mean, meaning mind revealing. Um, it, it's, um, it's got a cocktail effect in terms of uh, uh, how it works. It's, um, it's primarily a presynaptic pre 5-HT uh, releaser and reuptake inhibitor. To a lesser effect, it does that to dopamine. And uh, the effect it has on dopamine is dose dependent. So it does become more dopaminergic at the higher doses and maybe have more of a stimulating effect, more of that kind of amphetamine effect at high doses. It also has effects on um, uh, cortisol, adrenaline, and a profound effect on just dumping oxytocin. Um, uh, and yeah, like I say, for that reason, it's called the love drug. So um, uh, just a really brief history of uh, MDMA. So um, uh, uh, MDMA therapy um, began um, around the time as uh, LSD therapy was kind of, you know, uh, around back in the 1970s, mostly in America and in, in, in this country as well. It was first used by, you know, therapists and psychiatrists as an alternative to LSD therapy after LSD was made illegal. And then un unfortunately, uh, you know, it spilled out into um, more widespread recreational use and then it was made illegal and research on it had, had really stopped for the past several decades up until 2010-11 when the first Met Offer paper was published, sponsored by MAPS, and that was really a, a groundbreaking paper, um, uh, and, and I encourage you all to have a look at the, the, the first Met Offer paper and all the MAPS papers. Um, so MAPS was um, set up back in the 80s by its current founder, Rick Doblin, uh, to advocate for, raise money, and then um, uh, uh, try to do you know good quality uh, uh, randomized controlled trials looking at drugs like MDMA and the current model of MDMA assisted therapy is the MAPS model so so, so they're the only ones that have really uh, come up with a, a model that can that can be used. It's quite an unusual model it's based mostly off of um, 1970s LSD therapy um, uh, 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 work. So you have 16 sessions that kind of you know, look like therapy that we might expect. Um, you don't have one therapist, you've got two, so there's a dyad. Um, uh, two to three of those sessions of the 16 are drug assisted and typically they are long. So they're about eight hours long. Um, and um, the, the work that you do in the, the MAPS model of therapy is quite non-directive. So there might be three preparation sessions, get to know each other, getting to know about your trauma, psychoeducation around the, the medication. And then your first drug session 
um, you, you take the, the medication, the MDMA in the, in the clinical trials, first thing in the morning, about nine o'clock, um, you're lying on a bed, you're um, very comfortable, you're in a, a lovely set and setting, which is really important for psychedelic drugs. You're listening to pre-selected emotionally, uh, emotionally salient music um, throughout. You're wearing an eye mask. You've got your therapy dyad that you know really well sitting either side of you and you're um, directed to focus your attention inward. And then as the medication takes hold, um, patients who have suffered trauma, uh, you know, traumatic stress spontaneously do the sorts of things that you see in trauma-focused psychological therapies within themselves and um, uh, they, they, they do it without fear. They, they can take the eye mask and the, the music off and come out and talk about it, go back inwards, but it is quite, quite non-directive. Um, so based on the work maps have done in America, the FDA in America, the big kind of uh, drug agency have granted it breakthrough therapy status back in 2018. So it's been fast tracked through phase three in America. Um, Currently in the EU, um, we have the MP18 study, which is a multi-center phase two open label lead-in study. Um, so there's many different sites there. I'm the PI of the, the Cardiff site. We've got a London site. Eric's involved um, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Um, some sites are starting. We're all working off the same uh, protocol. It is sponsored by MAPS. They, they are the only organization that, that's funding this, this work, um, you know, primarily at the moment. Um, but we're hoping that as soon as all sites have begun and started phase two, we can go straight into phase three. And um, I'm quite quite hopeful, you know, cautiously optimistic for, for this. Uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in what phase three uh, data is going to come out and show as long as it's safe and effective. You know, hopefully this could become a treatment that, you know, we as clinicians can, can prescribe and can work with in the future. Um, and yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Matt. No, that that was that was a wonderful, comprehensive overview of, of, of compounds that have been registered, and and are in the pipeline. Or and th this one is a very promising that a lot of um, attention is, uh, is is being given to to MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Um, what I'd like to do, if you can close your presentation, Matt, then we oh, can sure. be back to the um, to the plenary of the right. There we, there we go. Thank you again. And um, I saw already a couple of questions in, in the chat, but um, I think since we have about uh, 20 minutes uh, for, uh, for discussion, we could figure, we could divide it into two, but I'd like to open it up. And maybe uh, if Kerry is, is with us, uh, give Kerry the first opportunity to maybe if you had a question to Matt, what you've been hearing about the pharmacotherapy, if you had one, um, but but maybe you can have the, the the priority of asking the the first question when when you hear this from um, from from overview just a just a comment sure. or a question or a response from your end, uh, Kerry. Sure, great great review, Matt. Thanks so much. Um, one one um, I, th I think you know MD, MDMA maybe starting with that because I think that always brings such a, a little amount of excitement and people hearing about the story as well as maybe you know maybe skepticism as well. I guess on the excitement side, um, there's, a, there's a couple studies, and one of which I was involved with, that shows even in rodents, MDMA seemed to enhance extinction of fear. So even if you take away all the complex components of the interpersonal and, and what does it mean to you know, have an MDMA high, there still seems to be something that's more mechanistic about enhancing relearning. So I think that's, that's on the positive side. I think the, 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 side, the thing that always comes up with these studies with talking about psychedelics is, um, the near impossible nature of actually having a proper placebo control. Um, so what are your thoughts about how do you create an evidence-based data set for MDMA psychotherapy when, it, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine how um, you could placebo control it. Thanks. Well, yeah, um, so I, I suppose I'm going to talk about two things. So MAPS have been using uh, low-dose MDMA as the active placebo and then asking, you know, um, therapists whether they think it was you know, was the person having an MDMA full dose experience or a low dose experience? And that's helped with blinding. Blinding is always going to be a difficult um, proposition when you've got such a profoundly consciousness altering drug. But right. Just, just as a sort of a frame of reference, then we'll dive into questions. What you've been hearing, Kerry has been referring to the golden hour opportunity, which is, a, it's not yet PTSD, it's sort of the immediate aftermath of trauma. And he's been looking at biological systems and, and probably pharmacological compounds that are by array probably very different than the compounds that you've heard uh, Matt talk about. 
So we need to be aware that we are dealing with a disorder that is phase oriented or in, in a phase phased approach, very different in time, maybe has different phases. So just not to confuse everything that we lump everything together, the, the, golden, hour, the golden hours are in the immediate aftermath and PTSD is from a month after having been exposed to the trauma where the you know, inability to bounce back until years after, it could be 20 years later. So the strategies and the compounds that then we're using are quite, can be quite similar, but can also be quite different. Uh, in its in its in its um, in its um, um, biological profile. So may I redirect it to you, Irina, and and ask you if you can uh, guide us through the questions. That I saw a few questions already in the in the chat. Uh, that yeah, were yeah. One of them, I think, like the last one, is related to the topic we've discussed. Just like uh, the question is from May Abdin, wouldn't MDMA cause bad trips and further flashbacks? Mm. That's a question for Matt, right? Yeah, interesting question. Um, uh, probably not. So people can have difficult psychedelic experiences, but um, because of the, um, the the unique kind of effect of MDMA, people um, generally, you know, have quite positive experiences because it, it 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 absolutely dumps oxytocin. You feel very loved up. You feel very happy and relaxed. But people can still have difficult experiences with with it. However, when they go through that difficult experience, um, they're quite often doing a lot of work, um, you know, and, you know, there's an old saying, there's no such thing as a bad trip, because you often learn something from a bad trip, but um, MDMA, um, you know, in, in, the, in the MAP studies, there have been no serious adverse events reported, uh, people haven't needed to use um you know rescue medications during sessions like lorazepam or, or anything like that um quite often you know if people if people are having um, an experience of panic during an mdma session it's often short-lived and it's often in the uh, initial kind of up swing phase where they're where they may be panicking about you know the um uh the the onset of the the coming up as it were um uh, and oftentimes it's reassurance maybe you know uh holding their hand until they're acclimatized to it but um, yeah, pe people don't don't generally have um, profoundly negative experiences with with uh, uh, psychedelics like MDMA. With drugs like LSD and psilocybin, you can have much more unpredictable experiences, and uh, you know you can have scary you know psychological kind of events with those sorts of drugs, uh, but not so much with MDMA. Now, Matt, if I may chime in here, um, uh, you didn't mention uh, two drugs that are often used. One is medical marijuana that we, medical cannabis, that we in the Netherlands seem to also be appreciated more as a medicine. It's not a, a treatment for PTSD, but in, in, the, in the range of, of symptom um, 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 normalization to, the, to a certain extent. And, and ketamine, there's, a, there's an array of no, novel, novel, novel interest from, an, from a depression perspective. And there's now yeah. the Spratava that's on the market. Uh, and any speculation maybe on both compounds for the treatment of PTSD? <laughs> Yeah, so um, uh, I'll have to I'll have to admit my my ignorance to the the current evidence base when it comes to cannabis. Um, I don't believe there's an RCT looking at uh, cannabis for for PTSD, um, uh, but I know Maps have been doing some work and setting up some 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 trials looking at uh, cannabis with um, uh, PTSD. There's been one published study by um, uh, Feda and colleagues on ketamine for um, uh, PTSD. I'm really quite interested in, interested in in, in uh, ketamine for depression and trying to set up maybe an open label study in Cardiff looking. At, uh, looking at that, but um, the study uh, by Feder um, was a was a crossover study where they gave uh, a bolus of ketamine to patients with PTSD and then crossed them over. It was underpowered. Um, it, it it may be hopeful in the future. I think you know the the. Um, the responses we've seen from ketamine in depression have been quite staggering, and it's a completely different model. It's not a monoamine, uh, not a monoaminergic uh, drug. Um, it's more of a dialysis model of treating depression than a drug everyday model. Um, yeah. So it, it it would be interesting to see what future research might have for PTSD I can and recommend, ketamine. I can recommend. Thank you. I can recommend the audience to look into the um, the editorial that was also published in the American Journal of Psychiatry to that uh, Adriana Federer paper. By, by Mary Steen from uh, UCSD that was very eloquently and that also gave an outline of where this research might go in, 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 in the direction of look further further um, uh, protocols. Uh, and, and I see you not, Kerry, do you want to comment on this too, please, if you, if you wish? I mean, I think, you know, um, from a neurobiological side, probably it's important for the audience to hear that, you know, if, if there's one theme across 
the psychedelics, including ketamine as a dissociative, the thought is that it's it's enhancing plasticity, um, and that this this enhancement of plasticity with with MDMA is thought to then both you know by with with potentially the oxytonergic, the serotonergic components, along with the plasticity may, may allows for this very deep sort of exposure, prolonged sort of if you will, expo you know almost um, um, you know long-term exposure component that's plastic and similarly with ketamine that's a lot of what's being thought and a lot of the antidepressants that seem to work are thought to happen through plasticity i think back to your point about the early aftermath that we don't know is that plasticity has a good and a bad component right and i think once you have ptsd we're really searching for plasticity to relearn that the world is safe and isn't always dangerous whereas in the immediate aftermath of trauma or in people who are in ongoing dangerous situations that plasticity could potentially you know, encode, further encode the, the trauma memory. And so we have to be thoughtful about what is the timing and what are we learning at what times related to the exposure. Thanks. Well, that taps into a question, if I may, Carrie, because I was listening to your presentation and typically what we see in PTZ is from stimulus specificity towards stimulus generalization, right? That's what people suffer from. So they think the whole world is bad. And we think about, when we think about reconsolidation, we bring back that specific stimulus. Well, whereas the patient 20 years down the line has not suffered from that specific uh, 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 memory, but, but maybe from an array of generalized, and there's also a biological component probably to stimulus generalization. So what do you think in terms of stimulus generalization and reconsolidation? I know that may be a very, a very broad question, but just, just some thoughts, and then we'll go back to the questions from the audience. Just your first sure, I think a lot of the treatments, um, you know, a lot of the exposure-based therapies, you know, likely what we think we're doing is is both training safety back out of generalization. So you've generalized so the whole world is dangerous and you're sort of retraining the brain. No, here and here and here and here, I actually am safe. And even though those memories are there, I'm not in that dangerous situation. Um, it's hard to know where reconsolidation fits exactly into that, but I think in mm -hmm. terms of a lot of the hippocampal deficits that we see um, and the contextual components are thought to directly relate to that generalization component. Um, and that, um, that early distress and dissociation probably are in some ways taking declarative memory offline during the aftermath of trauma. And so helping Emily Holmes, Tetris work and other things are interesting ways of thinking about can we reactivate the hippocampus and enhance that sort of contextual learning so that the memory is encoded in the specifics of the trauma and not generalized to one's entire environment. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Irina, can we redirect it to you? And uh, maybe you can address some yeah. further questions from the audience. Um, yeah, actually, I had pr probably uh, the same question as you, Eric, but uh, it's more like practical from, from the clinical practice. Uh, like um, the usually patients with PTSD. Oh, oh, you need to put your earphone in because we lose your, we lose your audio. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can, yeah. Sorry, so uh, my question is more from pr the practice. Uh, and uh, sometimes patients with PTSD, they have problem with sexual arousal because when they are sexually aroused, they start having dissociative symptoms or some like uh, traumatic memory reconsolidation. And my question to Carrie was like, is there just the uh, association with the trauma uh, or it's the neurobiological background for, for this as well? It's a great question. I think probably both in some ways. I think certainly people who've experienced sexual assault or interpersonal violence or, or, or childhood sexual assault, you know, then I think the sexual arousal in and of itself is a trigger for the trauma exposure leading to dissociation. But we certainly imagine that the sympathetic arousal and some of the other internal hormonal states related to sexual arousal may also be internal triggers for people. So that's the way I, I would think of that. Thank you. Um, I think directly, just, just from a clinical perspective, I think directly facing that head on and talking with your patients about it, asking about it, and, and that can be part of the exposure, um, you know, at least imaginally, with them so that they can help, you know, re-separate in their minds and through plasticity the events so that they can have a more healthy life. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to ask the audience, maybe somebody uh, have a question to yeah. our speakers who would like to uh, ask the question. And maybe also, uh, Joseph, if you had a question, let's ch ch just chime in. Um. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, th I think 
sort of um, realizing that many of the people who are participating are, are, are started, I, I would like to share with you my experience with Prazazin, or actually the experience of Mary Ruskin. Mary Ruskin was the one who started this. Uh, he started it uh, at 2003, and it basically started from his uh, clinical experience. So he was intrigued by seeing a patient with PTSD that was treated with prazosin, and then he took it and studied it, and, and, and really uh, in this regard, from clinical ob ob observation to clinical study, and then to do it again and again. I think it's something that everybody can uh, do, no matter where are you uh, in any place. So the importance of clinical ob ob observation is very important. So this is just one note. Uh, I was there in Seattle while he was seeing this first time, and I have some, some sort of personal experience uh, how you can do it. The other and, point. And, and Yossi, if I may add, if I may add to that, it's beautiful because you look at the praises in story. There were first a couple of, you know, small studies, six I think, small studies, and then there was this big, massive, multi-site study that didn't show any result anymore. So everybody was excited about prazosin and aldosteron and doxazosin, and then the signal was gone. So what are we doing wrong in a way if we started doing the multi-site trials? Is this the golden, golden answer or did we lose something in the stratification of the, of, of the participants in this study? It's, it's an open question, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a very good point. I think with PTSD, it's even more important because in PTSD, there are some legal issue, and we need to take care of this while we are doing studies. Yeah, can I just comment on that? Yes, go ahead, think, Terry. Because I think there's a broader thing that's really important. Um, I think it's. I think we saw that with prazosin. We saw that with decycloserine. I imagine we're going to see it with MDMA. It's going to work great in the small studies, and then we're going to start doing large things, and then weird things are going to happen, or it's not going to work so well. And I think all of this comes down to one of the points we had in the earlier discussion, that PTSD is not one thing. Depression is not one thing. If we have these big studies where we're treating everybody the same, and we're not stratifying for who is more likely to respond to which thing, we're likely, to, when we have large studies, to, to lose our signal. And so I think it really comes back to the title, you know, precision medicine and psychiatry, and how how do we best understand who's going to be most responsive to praises and that based on sympathetic response, who based on whatever exclusion inclusion is going to work for MDMA, how do we make sure decycloserine is given at the right time in the right place with exposure, you, can, you know, the CRH antagonists, the um, endocannabinoid drugs. So it's all going. To, I think I think it's about bringing back biology back in for the right precision medicine tr um, predictors and stratifiers. Sorry, thanks, Josie. Great, great, great answer. And you, that, that's a beautiful frame that you put to this uh, precision psychiatry. I know that we're kind of at the bottom of the hour, but um, I do want to, and of course, there are many, many more questions. And this is beautiful, what Kerry just did. As we're speaking, he already answered some of the questions in the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you, Kerry. Now, I want to also give you the opportunity, um, uh, not, not the very last word, but Matt, maybe do you want to make a comment, an overall comment or a, or a closing comment from your end, Matt? Oh, yeah, sure. I, um, I, f I forgot to um, uh, uh, pop a link on my slides for the, uh, the article that, that uh, Prof. Bisson and our two students did. So the Cardiff algorithm, I've just put it in the chat. Great. Um, Thank you. So, Thank so you. yeah, you can have a look at that. Um, but no, just thank you very much for having me. All right. We have okay. a, just, I, I, I just would like to make a one point. It's referring to the question of Anna about benzodiazepine oh. and going back to the point of uh, the timeline in PTSD. There oh. are some studies that suggest that if you give benzo in the first night, you might actually exacerbate uh, and prevent recovery from PTSD. So uh, again, it's highlight that in PTSD, you need to take very close look at the timeline and what you are doing in the first night 
or in the first months might be different or should be different from what you're doing later on. So I think uh, everybody here should sort of think about it and take into consideration the, the timeline. Thanks for making that point. Um, um, so there's many, many more questions I feel, but we need to, to, to respect the time and and um, and I think that I'm about to close this uh, this session, and I um, I would like to do that by um, by thanking um, uh, the participant speakers here, Kerry Kerry Ressler, and beautiful how you framed precision psychiatry in your last comment as that that's really what we need to take take note of the biology of precision psychiatry, computational modeling of precision psychiatry, and that gives us a a, a novel opportunity of um, of looking into to treatment strategies. Um, and, 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 and also, Matt, uh, th this is beautiful. Our work needs to have these systematic reviews that can really look at where were we, where we're coming, where we're going, and, um, and tailoring, tailoring um, beautiful how you said that you were personally intrigued by this, but also that we need to look at drug, drug psychotherapy interactions and, and, and assisted psychotherapy is probably the same with ketamine and same with MDMA, a, a, very, a very promising uh, strategy uh, to go. It's beautiful that we can do this in COVID times because we're all, all looking at a third or a fourth or a, a, a curfew and, and stuff. So that's why we do it this way and respecting all the time zone. Uh, Joseph and, and Irina have a lot of fun preparing this and, um, and we, we've tried to do our best um, and we, we, we've cut some corners because this could go on for, for, for a long time. But uh, this is going to be available through a YouTube channel. So give us a little bit of time to um, to put it on the website so you can, because these presentations need to be re revisited. I think there's so much richness in, in what you've just heard. So go to the website of ECNP, um, keep, keep posted. We will do this in uh, how many months or so? Two months, I think. We'll have another hot topics that we are preparing. So we look forward to having you uh, come back. And uh, any last words from you, Irina or Joseph, before we close? Just thank you to everybody. Yeah. And Joseph, from your end. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Hope to see some of you in person within the next year. Yes, that will be lovely. All right. Have a great uh, Friday afternoon, evening, and a great weekend. And look forward take, to next time. Take care. Thank you all. Stay safe. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.